So as you know, this um, series is a little bit different from the ones we've run before. We wanted to bring more of the uh, social sciences in and, and uh, really start talking about the implications of uh, climate change, which is why we titled it, How Safe Are You? And as it happened, three of the five speakers were um, authors on these IPCC reports. So uh, Navin Ramankuti, who spoke here two weeks ago, uh, for those of you who were here for that. And then last week, uh, Christy uh, Aby, um, both were authors. And this week's uh, speaker is, uh, was also an author, lead author, actually, of um, the chapter on climate change and human security. So uh, it's a great honor. Uh, Mark has just flown in from uh, New York, where he uh, works at the Center for International Earth Science Information. It's a network. It's a it's an institute which sits inside the Earth Institute at Columbia University. So he's been the dep dep deputy director there for um, about a, almost, well, getting on to a decade, actually. Um, he's been with this season, C-I-E-S-E-N, uh, since 1998. Before that, he was teaching at, um, where is it, Williams, uh, Dartmouth, was it Williams? Williams. Williams, yeah. yeah. He is a political scientist, and just like... Um, Navin, he sent an incredibly long CV, and he's done, uh, you know, almost everything. But I think the most important thing for us is that he actually wrote the chapter on the topic that you're going to hear about tonight for the IPCC, and that topic is the intersection between climate change and global security. And so, with that very short introduction, I am going to turn it over to Mark Levy, if that's going to work. Join me in welcoming Mark Levy from Columbia University. Uh, thank you very much, Arne, and thank all of you for coming out here um, to help discuss these important issues. Um, I do want to make sure that I clarify um, in the arcane nomenclature of the IPCC, um, a lead author is not the lead author. Uh, it's, it's, it's what most of us would think of as a co-author. Uh, the, the lead author on the human security chapter uh, was jointly a position held by Neil Adger and Juan Poulin, uh, and then I think there were six others of us who were, who were lead authors. Um, so, uh, in thinking about how I would, was going to summarize uh, the, my main messages to you, I found myself indulging in a little bit of uh, reflective autobiography. Um, uh, I was telling Arne that I've been working on climate and security issues, um, you know, all the way back to the, uh, uh, the early 90s, late 80s. Um, and at the time, when I was uh, trying to choose a topic for my, you know, my profession, my career, what, what was I going to focus on? Um, I was studying international politics um, in the late 80s. And at the time, all of my peers were working on either international economics or international military security, the good old-fashioned security before it got soft. Um, and so I did some soul searching and I decided, you know, what I really cared about um, was approaches to the world that are exemplified by people like this, uh, who are motivated by ideals, by values, uh, commitment to science. Um, power doesn't really show up as the number one, uh, you know, virtue on these sorts of people's agendas. Um, and so I decided that I was going to work on international environmental issues and not the trade politics, monetary politics, nuclear weapons, um, bombs and bullets that all of my uh, peers in graduate school were doing. Um, and so it's been really bizarre that today I find myself interacting with people like this and not like people on the earlier slide. Um, because the, even though you know, back in graduate school, uh, people like me who were interested in working on the environment were largely thought of as, you know, kind of like flakes uh, because we were working on things that weren't the most important. Um, the world has really changed now. And, um, and, and all of those people, some of those, you know, 
people have those kinds of ranks now. And um, the conventional military security establishment is now paying a lot of attention to climate change. Uh, so it's, it's a very, uh, if it weren't for these kinds of ironies, life would be much less interesting. Um, what those generals are talking about is this report, which was released um, in the middle of last year. Um, this was one of many documents uh, in the last 10 years that have tried to make the case for the, the world to take climate change as a security issue seriously. Um, this report was authored by a number of retired high-level military officials, most of them generals or admirals. Um, and so their bottom line conclusion is, um, highlighted there at the bottom, um, that in our career, we've never seen anything more serious than climate change in security terms. You know, forget the humanitarian, the biodiversity, any of that stuff. Just as a traditional security issue, this is num issue number one. Um, the ball kind of really got rolling fast on this um, in 2008 in the US when um, Congress required the National Intelligence Council to do a formal assessment of the seriousness of climate change as a security threat. Um, and this general here, Rich Engel, um, uh, within the National Intelligence Council has led that work and he continues to lead uh, the, the NICS uh, work on climate change to this day. Um, the report concluded that uh, the national security was threatened by climate change and it had to be taken very seriously. Uh, unfortunately, the report is still classified, so I haven't been able to read it, um, and uh, there are only summaries available for the public. But it, it got a lot of people taking the issue seriously in the security establishment, and so now a whole string of uh, documents have made more or less uh, the same point. So the very next year, um, the intelligence community's assessment within the US on the most potent threats facing the country uh, devoted you know, four whole pages out of a 43-page document to environmental security, and climate change was the most important of those. Um, each report since then has had the same emphasis. Um, the most recent um, high-level um, you know, government-wide assessment of uh, security threats to the US uh, reached this exact same conclusion, that when we look at all the things threatening the US, uh, terrorists, uh, insurrections, cybersecurity, et cetera, uh, climate change is right up there. Um, the Department of Defense has a uh, high-level position devoted to sustainability, um, and uh, that office has led a climate change adaptation uh, planning exercise. Um, so they're not only uh, within the security establishment, you know, waking up to the severity of climate change as a threat, you know, but they're marching right along and, and now actually planning to undertake adaptation measures across the whole range of Department of Defense uh, activities in terms of procurement, training, um, and strategy. Now, it's not just the US. Um, uh, one formal attempt to, to codify high-level official security doctrine uh, in published documents in as many countries as could be obtained uh, found that 70% of countries are now classifying uh, climate change as a national security issue. Is Canada? <laughs> um, I think Canada has to, but I haven't looked it up. Maybe someone can Google it while we're talking. Um, I know they're acting in that manner. Whether it's in published doctrine, I don't know. Um, I, I put, Canada would not surprise me. So I tried to find an example that is surprising. Uh, so Taiwan, which, you know, as you know, um, has from its very origins been fixated on what they see as the security threat of mainland China. And it's, it's defined, you know, the political movement, uh, the culture, the country, 
uh, doctrine from the very beginning. Um, and in 2009, they were hit with a, an extremely severe um, cyclone, um, which even in spite of their advanced levels of preparedness and training, um, you know, really hit them very hard. So the president um, went out of his way to say, this is what we need to be worrying about. Uh, these severe storms, which are only gonna get worse with climate change, that's our real security threat. Uh, it's not as important as mainland China. And he actually canceled a, uh, an order for a bunch of attack helicopters. He said, we don't need helicopters with guns to fight these imaginary Chinese. He didn't say imaginary Chinese, but he said, we don't need helicopters with guns. We need helicopters that can get relief to storm victims. Um, to me, that's mind blowing. And, he's, and he got reelected. He's, he's still president. Um, in addition to all these statements and studies and assessments, um, the, the Daily News has served to reinforce the connection between climate and security. Um, in the case of Syria, um, a plausible case could be made that this is a, a conflict that has very strong connections to climate change. Um, in the lead up to the outbreak of open armed hostilities, uh, there was an extremely severe drought that was spread over virtually the entire country. Um, so you had a, a very long duration drought of a magnitude that had never been witnessed before covering the entire country. Um, some of the uh, published work has even made the claim that this is uh, the most severe drought since the origins of civilization in the Fertile Crescent. That's a statement that can't be proven. Um, but across the, um, the measurement record since 1900, it can be demonstrated that this is the most severe climatic shock the country has faced. Um, so during the five years of that drought, before the Civil War <coughs> broke out, um, you had um, massive loss of production of um, farmland. Uh, you had massive relocation of people as they were forced to find new ways to make a livelihood. Um, and you had massive um, resentment um, that the government was not helping them. And so, uh, so many close observers of this case argue um, uh, that the Syria case is strongly connected to climate change. Now there's, there's many reasons for civil war to break out in Syria and we'll never know the counterfactual. If uh, uh, you run history over again without this drought, who knows what it would have happened. It's possible a civil war would have still broken out. But it's undeniable um, that the, 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 the depth of the suffering and the extent of the dislocation of the population um, certainly made things worse. I first started hearing this case be made um, by, by military analysts. Uh, it was, it was the, the climate community came to this uh, case late. The, the people who were looking at this through a traditional security lens said the drought was a major driver of this conflict. Zero line, is that the average That's the long-term average. The, the top graph is the stream flow through the Euphrates. Uh, and the bottom is the, uh, the rainfall uh, map. Um, the, the 2012 Civil War in Mali uh, was also preceded by a very severe drought, which led to a lot of um, uh, population movement and suffering and resentment that the government wasn't helping them. And then before that, as most of you probably know, the, uh, the Darfur, uh, civil war and genocide was preceded by a very long, uh, very severe drought. And, and many of the attempts to reconstruct the causal pathways through that uh, conflict have laid part of the blame, in some cases a lot of the blame, uh, to the dynamics triggered by that drought. Uh, the movement of people, the loss of livelihood, and the, the, the violent competition between uh, farmers and herders. So um, 
with, with all these events taking place and all this mounting evidence, um, this, this connection between climate and security is now starting to be institutionalized. Um, so regularly since 2007, uh, the UN Security Council has held uh, briefings and debates on the question of climate change, something the founders of the UN you know, never in a million years would have anticipated. Um, but the Security Council has now done it often enough that it's simply a routine matter. Um, it's not taken as a controversial step for them. So it's enough to make all my old graduate school friends who thought my choice to focus on the environment to make their heads explode. Um, and they more or less has. Uh, so this week, uh, Foreign Policy Magazine, uh, jointly with William and Mary, released the results of a poll of professors of international relations. Um, and uh, they were mainly asking them, or the, the thing Foreign Policy published was a, a rank order of all the best schools to study international relations. Uh, Columbia University is number five, if you um, want to take note. But they also asked them, what's the most important issue in international relations today? And so over 40% said climate change, um, which surprised even me. Um, and so now the, um, I often run into people at conferences and workshops and so on where the feelings are 100% reversed from the late 80s. Uh, and they're slaving away in obscurity, working on you know, monetary politics. Uh, and they're jealous of the people who are working on climate change and getting all the attention. Um, so it shouldn't be surprising that the IPCC wanted, in the fifth assessment report, to take a look at the security connection. Um, and the, the way the IPCC is, is set up, it's a, it's a demand-driven exercise. So it does assessments of questions that the governments of the world want answers to. Um, so in the negotiation of the scope of work for the fifth assessment, the government said, we want you guys to tell us what in the world is going on with these climate and security connections. Um, so there, there was a chapter on human security. Um, and this is the briefest possible summary of it. Um, that, um, that when you add up the magnitude of the highly likely <coughs> impacts of climate change on human society, um, it is very likely that those will constitute a severe threat to human security. Um, Now, human security in the IPCC framework, which was dictated by what the governments wanted, um, is not the same kind of security that all those generals I showed you pictures of uh, think of. Um, and so it's important. Um, one of my messages is that we need to work harder to bridge communities uh, so that we can work together uh, to treat this question with the seriousness that it deserves. Um, so I usually don't spend a lot of time on definitions, um, but in this case, I just want to make it clear that um, human security in this context means a condition in which human values that are very important are severely threatened. Um, so those values might be territorial integrity, which is what the generals care about, um, but they might also be a sense of cultural identity. So if an Arctic community, uh, which has built its whole identity around seasonal ice melt, uh, hunting rhythms, and things like that, um, loses the ability uh, to locate its sense of identity with a particular place because those two things become out of sync, um, then that's a human security problem. Um, if people have to get uprooted and have to move from one location to another, even if nobody shoots at them, that's still a human security problem if they don't want to make that move, if they're forced to do it because of the climatic conditions. Um, so these are the, the conclusions from the IPCC report, um, that, that climate change was going to uh, make more people move that didn't want to. It was going to threaten livelihoods in a serious enough way that people would experience that as a loss of security. 
Um, and, um, and the conditions that support human security uh, would be threatened by climate change. Now, I think that um, that's kind of a bland message, right? Um, you know, you're probably not instantly tweeting that or posting that on Facebook to anybody. Um, the IPCC tends to um, uh, devolve to sa statements that are safe. They're politically safe, they're scientifically safe, and sometimes they're not the statements that people need. Um, the, the ground rules for the IPCC is that the, the, the mandate is to summarize the published literature. So if there's something important going on that's not published, you can't say anything about it. Um, if somebody somewhere publishes an article that says the opposite of what you think is true, you have to mention it. Um, and uh, the authors on the chapter have to agree. Uh, and then the governments get to kind of tinker and meddle with things at the end of the process, too. Um, so I don't know exactly what all your other speakers have said, but in my experience, um, as the IPCC moves from a, a narrow biophysical uh, focus, as it did in the early days, uh, to more uh, human impacts, um, that old model becomes less and less effective. And, and one of the ways that shows up is you get these very wishy-washy conclusions. Um, so, so what I want to do is make the case that if I were really the lead author in the English language version, you know, what I would have said. Um, and so I want to, in an unhedged way, just come straight out and say that climate change makes the world more violent. It makes the world have more conflict. Um, and that effect is big. Um, and we understand enough of these mechanisms that we don't have to hedge everything. We can just conclude that we know that and we can start acting to manage it. Um, so I think in this case, the generals have beat us to the punch. Um, the, the military strategist Bernard Brody, um, who was considered the leading expert on military strategy in the 1930s and early 40s, um, is said to have picked up the newspaper uh, in New Haven the day after the atomic bomb was dropped and turned to his wife and said, everything I've written is obsolete. Um, he instantly grasped that the invention of nuclear weapons changed everything about military strategy. What made sense before nuclear weapons didn't make sense now. And what was going to make sense had to be figured out because nobody knew what it was. And if, if anybody made a mistake, the stakes were going to be gigantic. Um, so Brody and a handful of other people you know, took as their mission to figure that stuff out as fast as they could. And one of the reasons that they were effective was because they admitted that the world was totally different. Um, now, I think in a much less dramatic way, but a still substantially analogous way, um, the world today, in terms of protecting security, is fundamentally different than the pre-climate change world. And so one of our jobs is to figure out the implications of that and to take it as seriously as the people who worried about preventing nuclear war did. So I'm going to make um, three arguments about why a world with climate change is much more violent and conflict ridden. Um, so the first is that it makes it harder to regulate conflict. Um, uh, so the evidence for this comes from a variety of sources. Um, and these, um, these next few uh, examples um, I'm, I'm ta I was exposed to through my uh, colleague Solomon Shang. Um, who's at uh, University of California, Berkeley. Uh, he's also uh, the best uh, poster for the Earth Institute. He was the first uh, PhD graduate of the Earth Institute's uh, graduate program on sustainable development. Um, 
I would not have found this article on my own, but, but Saul found it. Um, so this is looking at the effect of temperature on individual level aggression. And so they got some graduate student to sit at a, at a red light, first in line, ready to go. Uh, but then when the light turned green, they didn't go. Um, <laughs> and their instructions were to um, sit silently, facing straight ahead, um, and, and wait for the light to turn red. And then when it turned red, they made a, a legal right turn. Um, um, and so there was somebody sitting behind a shrubbery taking uh, note of how uh, many times uh, the people behind her honked the horn. Um, and so they, what they found was that the, uh, the hotter it was, the, the more horn honking there was. And, and when it was, the weather was really, really pleasant, there was basically no honking at all. Um, <laughs> Uh, now, it, baseball fanatics are crazy for statistics, so every single thing that happens in a baseball game is, is written down, and you can calculate anything you want. So one thing you can calculate is, uh, is violence. Uh, so somebody did a study where they looked at the relationship between temperature and this contagion effect where um, a pitcher will hit one batter, and then the other team's pitcher will hit the other team's batter, um, and then if things get really out of hand, that can you know, go on and on. Um, and sometimes it'll break out in a full physical fight. Um, so uh, the finding w was the same kind of uh, conclusion. Uh, the hotter it was in the baseball stadium the day of the game, the more likely it was that you were gonna have multiple batters hit deliberately by a pitch. Um, now, I know these kind of fights don't seem that serious to you because you're hockey fans and you, <laughs> you take your fights much more seriously. Um, the, the same kind of individual level um, mechanism uh, was also borne out in a really interesting study done um, in connection with the Dutch police force. Uh, so this is the one that, that tightly controls every parameter. Um, so they had a simulator to train uh, police recruits in um, controlling the use of deadly force. So they would expose them to a lot of uh, simulated situations um, and test them on whether or not they, they used uh, their weapons appropriately or not. Um, and so it was in a room, and we had a thermostat. Um, so someone got the idea, well, let's tinker with the thermostat and see what the scores are on the trainees. Um, they got the same exact picture. Um, the hotter they turned it up, the more often, more often the trainees uh, would use deadly force inappropriately. Now, none of that stuff would be relevant for this topic if it weren't for the fact that we see the same kind of mechanism when it comes to national level violence and political violence. Um, so you're all probably familiar with the El Nino phenomenon uh, in which the world goes through these cycles of uh, unusual weather. Um, the bottom graph is uh, the historical record of that kind of cycle. Um, when the, the red peaks are high, it means we have a very strong El Nino. So that, that graph at the bottom is like the, the thermostat in the Dutch uh, police training simulator. It lets us... Um, treat the world as a natural experiment, and we can see how violent the world gets uh, when the thermostat is up, uh, when we have a high El Nino, and when we have a low El Nino. Um, now, the world is divided into regions. Um, not all of the world is affected by an El Nino. Um, some of it is and some of it isn't. It starts with a, an ocean temperature anomaly in the, in the Pacific, um, and then it generates a systemic cascade through the, the entire um, uh, atmosphere. So the countries in red, their climate is affected by an El Nino. Um, when there is an El Nino, those countries have an elevated risk of civil war. Um, so that's what this line is here. So this is the strength of the El Nino, and this is the risk 
of a civil war breaking out. Uh, so the stronger the El Nino for these red countries, um, the higher the likelihood that a civil war will break out. Um, now, people, some people don't like these kinds of messages. It, it goes against the grain of what they think the world is supposed to look like and stuff. And um, a very common reaction is, well, but there's other things that are driving civil war, right? And, and if you only look at climate, you can't possibly be getting it right. Um, now, the, the biggest risk factor of all in, in political violence at a country level is the level of poverty. If you're, if you're rich enough, you have virtually none of this. If you're poor enough, you're very, very prone to it. Um, so that, what this comparison does is it shows that even when you look at the most important factor, um, the climate effect is still quite visible. Um, so this is the income per capita on this axis. Um, and this is um, looking at um, uh, times of the, in the Earth's history in which there is not an El Nino. Um, and it's dividing uh, the, the world into these two groups, the, the strongly connected to El Nino and those not connected. So when there's no El Nino going on in the world, you see that both groups of countries have the same basic relationship between income and conflict. If they're really poor, they have a high risk. If they're really rich, they have a very low risk. And the two groups don't look that different. But then you turn up that global you know, climate weirdness switch, um, and you hit it with an El Nino, and then the two groups behave differently. Um, so the poor countries that are strongly connected to El Nino suddenly have a, a much higher level of risk than the countries that are not affected. Um, so this is uh, you know, very clear evidence that the, the ability of countries to regulate conflict is strongly conditioned by the climatic stresses that they face. Uh, now, Shang and colleagues uh, did a, a meta-analysis in which they looked at every published study uh, that looked at the quantitative evidence linking um, violence and climate and summarized it in this 2013 paper. Um, uh, the, the red things are temperature. Um, the blue is precipitation. Um, and the green is uh, deviation from normal, whether it's high or low. Um, so what, the, what they found was um, in virtually every single study they looked at, you found the same general relationship as in that horn honking and that baseball fight study. Um, that the, the higher the temperature, the lower the rainfall, or the more abnormal the weather, um, the higher the level of risk of the violent outcome. You know, whether it's crime or a civil war um, uh, or, or anything else. Um, so they only found two out of 46 studies that did not find that relationship. Um, and what was especially interesting was that those studies spanned uh, very different spatial scales, you know, f down to that Dutch police simulator is, you know, just one building, um, you know, all the way to the entire globe. Um, sorry, the globe is up here. Um, and also different spatial scales, um, you know, whether, you know, it's minute by minute or for some of these, um, uh, paleoclimate studies where people look at you know, millennium uh, fluctuations in climate and try to correlate that with the, the rise and fall of civilizations, you've got very long time scales. Um, so their argument is that it would be really bizarre if all of these studies added up in this way and there were not a connection between climate and conflict. And I agree with that. Um, so th the very first studies that demonstrated a climate conflict link um, were published in the early 2000s. I'd say, I think 2003 was the first one. Um, so from 2003 to 2013, when, when Shang and colleagues tried to uh, you know, 
put to rest the debate about it um, is a very short period. Um, and it, it caught everybody by surprise. Um, uh, it caught me by surprise. Um, and I was, um, I was this study here. Um, and the reason I had done that study was because I was pretty sure that I was going to find that there was no relationship between uh, climatic variability and conflict. Uh, my earlier work on environment and security had largely um, tried to cast doubt on a lot of the alarmist claims uh, that people had been making. Um, and so I was, I was very surprised when I found what I did. Um, the other thing that's kind of weird about this evolution from 2003 to the present um, is that the most robust link that's been demonstrated is um, between temperature change um, and civil war. So civil war is when you have, you have to cross a threshold of at least 1,000 people dying in armed combat, you know, not just dying incidentally because of the collapse of society, but the you know, soldiers killing each other um, uh, for an extended period. Um, because somebody's trying to take over the government. Um, so that's a very high threshold to cross. Um, and a lot of the earlier speculation about climate change and violence said that it would come through things like precipitation, uh, which would affect the ability to grow crops uh, or get access to, to water. Um, so the fact that temperature had the strongest signal and that the outcome that was the most clearly related was civil war uh, is also bizarre. Um, when people look at other types of climate stress or other forms of violence, uh, like riots, protests, uh, communal violence, uh, uh, political atrocities, uh, the signal is much more mixed. Um, now, some people conclude from that that, uh, aha, we don't really know what's going on. Uh, so you know, hold your horses and, and wait and see uh, what these other questions turn out once we get better information. Um, uh, what people like me and the generals say is that um, the fact that the data are best for temperature and they're best for civil war, and that's where you find the best connection um, means that you should put most stock in that finding. And the fact that we have a weaker body of evidence on the other things might just be because the information is not as good. Uh, you know, so we have really good information on all the civil wars. You know, people, they know every single one that's happened. They know when they started, they know when they ended. They have a lot of information about how many people died. You know, every single time that one group you know, hurt another group, a lot of that stuff is missing. You know, we don't have nearly as good information. Uh, the same for uh, riots and protests. Um, now, the, f the conclusion that it's hard to regulate violence when the climate goes bad um, is really bad news for us today. You know, if we discovered this in, say, 1940, it would just be a curiosity. Um, but today, the climate is going nuts. Um, so this is uh, a graph showing the fraction of the Earth's land surface that's hotter than the temperature that you would expect to get once every 30 years or more. Uh, so it's a way of quantifying uh, the temperature extreme. Um, and so at present, we've got you know, like 40% of the Earth at the same time, hotter than we normally expect it to take you know, once every 30 years to get. And that's happening year after year after year. Um, so the way human societies have evolved, what we think of as normal, is now mostly not normal. Um, this is the, the average uh, temperature uh, deviation from normal. And this is just a different kind of summary of the same picture. Um, and you're probably used to all the headlines that say, guess what, last year was the warmest year ever. Um, so those, what, what's now average is 
what in the historical record is associated with a doubling of the conflict risk. So it's as if we just made the world twice as dangerous. Um, but it's even worse than that because um, some of the important background conditions that shape whether or not violence breaks out are also getting worse. Um, so this is a, a graph showing you the, the trends on democracies and autocracies. And if you only focus on those, it looks like everything is great. Um, the blue democracies are just you know, marching up like crazy. Um, the autocracies are in retreat. Um, but um, you can't get from lots of autocracies to lots of democracies without going through a transition. Countries don't change from one to the other in the blink of an eye. So with this, that same good news brings with it some really bad news, which is this rise in countries that are stuck in between. Uh, they're neither fully democratic nor fully autocratic. Um, uh, they have weak elements of both. Uh, Iraq is an example of a, of a country like that. Um, and those countries are the most at risk from political violence. So this is the, um, uh, the democracies at this end and the autocracies at this end. So these are all the countries um, on that autocracy to democracy scale against the likelihood of uh, political instability. Uh, so you can see that the risk peaks for this middle group of countries. Um, so living in a period in which you've got a growing number of those countries um, is bad. Um, now the most risky form of governance of all is something that the political scientists call factionalism, um, which is when you have a, a breakdown of the rules of the road in the political process uh, so that each group is fighting strictly for its own benefit and, and basically giving up on governing for the public good. Um, and so um, that's got the highest risk of all of civil war uh, breaking out in subsequent years. Um, and so that condition also is very high. Um, so uh, a few months ago, I, I um, decided to put some of these ideas to the test. Um, if, it, if I'm right that the main mechanism here is the decline in the ability to regulate conflict, um, then in addition to these uh, warfare outcomes, uh, we ought to see difficulty in conducting peaceful elections. Um, and elections is one of the things we happen to have pretty good information on. Um, and electoral violence is bad on its own terms, you know. Uh, so it's worth knowing. Now elections are getting more unstable. This is the trend since 1972 when the election database starts. Um, so this is um, the elections that are either canceled outright um, or um, um, subject to violent uh, protests and, and riots um, on the part of the citizens. So when either of those things happen, it goes into this database and the trend is going up. Um, so I, I related that data to the climate stress data. Um, and this was another case where I was genuinely surprised. Uh, it was a very clear relationship across a wide range of different measures of climate stress uh, with, a, with a linear relationship. The, the, the more severe the climate shock, the greater the likelihood that you would have an election problem. Um, so at the extreme, uh, the odds of having election instability uh, became 10 times uh, the normal baseline. Um, now one of the things, if, you're, if there's any statisticians here, you're probably seeing one of the complications of doing this kind of work, which is that these bad things I'm telling you about are going up at the same time as the climate is going up. And so it's possible that these two things are caused by something else. Um, 
and what I think is a relationship is just a connection to something else. So, so that's why we do this trick here of um, uh, controlling for the year. So even when you um, separately test within each year, uh, you get for the extreme levels of climate shock uh, the same relationship. Um, and that meta-analysis I showed you um, is undertaking the same kind of uh, statistical test to control for that kind of problem. The second mechanism is that when societies are hit with these kinds of problems, they often undertake measures that shift the risk onto someone else. Um, and that can not only not solve the problem, but it can make it worse, because it can lead to a potential for escalation. Um, so you know, a clear illustration of this is um, uh, rich countries that use a lot of uh, fossil fuels um, uh, want to lower their uh, carbon emissions. And so many of them have put in place quotas for biofuel consumption. So that's led to an explosion of biofuel production. This is the global production of, of biofuels. Um, this is serving to displace risk from the rich countries to the poor countries. Um, because the places where the biofuels is, the, is being grown, where the stock is being grown, the palm oil plantations, um, you're having to convert what the land used to be. It may have been uh, you know, uh, peasant farmland. It may have been forest, uh, which had you know, mixed use, multiple communities. Uh, getting livelihoods from it, you're converting that to a plantation where typically like one company is getting all the money. Um, and so, you know, people will often fight over that. So these are armed guards protecting a palm oil plantation in Honduras. Um, it also displaces risk by raising food prices. So anybody that has a large fraction of their household budget going to food is suffering uh, because of those policies. Um, another case of risk shifting is the practice of uh, countries that are worried about the impacts of climate change and other forces that are diminishing their ability to feed themselves, um, undertaking long-term land leases or purchases um, in other countries. Um, uh, China is the one that's in the news a lot, but a lot of countries are doing this. Um, they, they go after the, the lowest price land they can get. So this tends to be in very poor countries, uh, which have very weak uh, land registration laws, very weak uh, property rights. Um, so there's, there's many documented cases of communities um, suffering you know, quite a bit as a result of this practice. It's a logical, rational risk management practice if you're a wealthy country worried about uh, lack of arable land and water, um, but it diminishes um, the, the security of the communities in many, communi in many locations where it takes place. Um, the reason this country is not showing up, um, Madagascar, is because the effect was so severe there that it led to a collapse of a government. Uh, in 2009, the president signed a secret land lease uh, with South Korea Someone found out about it, uh, became subject of mass protests, and he had to leave office. Um, another logical thing to do if you're worried about the effect of climate change is to divert rivers or build dams uh, to increase your ability to irrigate crops uh, or provide drinking water or water for industry or power generation. Um, but this is almost by definition the classic case of you know, what makes sense to you hurts the person downstream. Um, one of the cases that are a lot of people are worried about from a security point of view um, is this region, um, where the trends of growing population, growing consumption, uh, compounded by the effects of climate change, are, are making all the countries really worried about their water security. Uh, so they're all undertaking measures uh, to try to um, manage those risks. Um, but China, uh, which is upstream on many of these basins, has the ability to help itself at the expense of others. Um, 
So in a worst case scenario, you could have deterioration of bilateral relations among some of these countries because of this. You have the same kind of issues going on in the, the Nile, for example. Another example of risk shifting is um, the imposition of export bans on uh, food commodities. Um, in 2010, Russia was hit um, with a drought in its wheat belt, which was the most severe drought in its entire history. Um, it's very hard to connect drought to climate change um, because you're talking about a single event and it can have multiple causes. But sometimes they're so severe and so bizarre uh, that you can make a direct attribution. And this is one of those cases where the scientists have, scientists have concluded that the 2000 drought in Russia was driven by climate change. Uh, Russia lost a lot of its uh, wheat harvest. Some of it literally caught on fire. Um, and so uh, they put in place an export ban. Um, uh, Egypt imports uh, a lot of its wheat from Russia. Uh, and the way the international wheat trade is organized, uh, there's, it's very hard to substitute uh, because you can't get ships that are used to going in one sea line to go to another one quickly enough. Um, so uh, in 2010, there was actually serious talk that Egypt might literally run out of food. Uh, not just that the prices would get so high that they would create problems, but there just wouldn't be enough uh, grain offloaded at the port. Um, third mechanism is uh, cascades of systemic risk. Um, so going back to that, um, uh, to the Middle East for a while, um, the, um, in the lead up to Arab Spring, uh, it was one of those hottest year ebers. Um, it was also a year in which those uh, uh, high temperatures and droughts um, led to very high food price shocks. Um, so the, the global food price index shot up uh, you know, quite high, uh, the highest it had been since 1973. Um, uh, so you had high prices everywhere. You had 70 countries uh, restrict exports. Uh, so the ability to even count on being able to get the imports you needed was called into question. Um, in Tunisia, these things interacted with normal politics. Uh, you had an autocratic regime. You had um, a populace that was unsatisfied with the performance of the regime, desiring more openness, uh, more voice, and so on. Um, and. Uh, the two form sort of a cauldron in which the, the high price of food um, and the shortages of food uh, became one of the most potent issues mobilizing people into the streets um, and, uh, and brought down the government. Um, now that triggered a, a different kind of systemic effect. So you're going from weather uh, to food uh, to politics within one country that triggered the contagion across the whole North Africa region. Um, uh, and at the end of that year, um, you know, people were uh, left wondering, you know, what in the world happened? Uh, the, the changes from the price shocks through to Tahrir Square and the collapse of regimes and revolutions, uh, instability throughout the whole region, um, was not a risk that people had been thinking about because they had, did not have mechanisms in place to assess these systemic interconnections. Um, now a little spin-off from there. Um, uh, in, in Mali, um, back in the 70s and 80s, you had political problems over drought. Um, and that was a function of the the, the big long-term drought that affected the entire Sahel. Um, among the many people who were affected were a nomadic community in northern Mali and Niger, the, the Tuareg, who are used to moving around in response to shifting weather patterns. But with a really big long-term drought, they have to move quite a bit. Um, the Tuareg kept moving and moving and moving. 
Um, and many of them ended up in Libya. Uh, the Gaddafi regime um, decided to, to train these guys, to teach them radical ideology, um, to arm them. Um, you know, and he sent them all over the region, you know, carrying out terrorist acts. Um, and so they became good at uh, creating unrest. Um, when Gaddafi was de deposed in Arab Spring, um, many of these armed, radicalized Tuareg you know, were not exactly welcome uh, in Libya. And so many of them went back to Mali, um, where they joined up with other ideological allies and, and toppled the government there. Um, so you could make a plausible case that the drought in the 70s is linked to the, the, the training and arming of the Tuareg, which is linked to their uh, coming back into Mali, which otherwise wouldn't have really been connected to Arab Spring. Um, uh, but it got connected through that you know, fairly complicated pathway. So just as it's a bad time to have extra hits on your ability to regulate conflict, uh, this is a really bad time to have um, higher levels of systemic risk. Um, the, the food price shock in 2008 now appears to be the new baseline. Um, and so when people today talk about what food price shock should we be worried about, uh, they're talking not about a doubling of the long-term average, but a quadrupling. They're talking about doubling of the new normal. Um, in addition, um, the, the food shocks we had in the good old days of the 70s when you know, all of our governments were stockpiling grain and food. Um, we had heavy, in, heavy involvement of government uh, in the agricultural sector. Um, you had a lot of slack and a lot of ability to, to move things fast when you needed to. Um, today, um, governments don't maintain stocks. Uh, the only country in the world that maintains sizable grain stocks is China. Uh, and they do it for their own purposes, not to stabilize world markets. Um, and uh, you know, we've, we've moved the entire economic system to just-in-time production and delivery. Um, so when a crisis hits, uh, the system is very fragile. Uh, when you had severe floods uh, a few years ago in Bangkok, um, uh, a large number of manufacturers uh, were unable to run their um, assembly lines because they couldn't get hard drives, which were all bottled up in port in Bangkok, which couldn't get them out. And this even affected some of the security applications, um, uh, some of the de defense um, equipment uh, was unable to be delivered on time because they were dependent on hard disk deliveries. So the, and I'm sure Navin Amankuti showed you something similar to this. Um, in addition to the economic system becoming more fragile, uh, we are stressing all of the life support systems to unprecedented levels. So these are individual graphs of different pressures on natural systems. Uh, things like deforestation, water abstraction, pollution loads, and so on. And the, the main message is that in the level of the Anthropocene, all of these systems are at historically unprecedented levels of attack. Um, so it means when we worry about um, stressing one system and having that put in motion a chain reaction, um, it's very hard to predict what that chain reaction is going to be because all of these pieces that are going to follow um, are in states that they've never been in before. So. <clears throat> I think the generals are more are on the right track. You know, when the IPCC is kind of forced into this really sober, cautious, on the one hand, on the other hand, um, you know, I'm not sure that that is consistent with the facts. Uh, so you have, on the one hand, I've made this argument that it's harder to regulate conflict. Um, the actions that people are undertaking to manage the risk shifted onto other people, and the systems are unstable. And at the same time, all of those three uh, issues are 
on their own terms, apart from climate change, um, becoming disadvantaged. And that's what this is summarizing here. Um, and we only know about these risks um, through mechanisms of discovery um, and uh, you know, brutal encounters with the world um, that completely surprised us. We weren't looking for this. Uh, when we first started to see evidence of it, we didn't believe it. Um, and now it's hitting us in the face and we can't ignore it. Um, so if that's true, you know, there's probably even worse things that are gonna happen tomorrow or the next year or the year after that we also are not anticipating today. Um, you know, I do work not just on climate insecurity, but environment insecurity more broadly. And, you know, across the board, all of the most potent discoveries that we found in that field have been things that caught us by surprise. Uh, we were not looking for them, we weren't ready for them. Um, so, I'm freaked out about it. But not everyone is. Um, so if you're holding out hope, uh, you have some allies. Um, so the people who argue about climate insecurity um, uh, often get really nasty and testy with each other. Um, so some of these were on the slides before. Uh, this is Richard Toll saying that we have this silly statement. This is the actual statement that um, he was objecting to, which I actually look back at my old drafts, um, um, which actually I wrote when I was in the Olympic Peninsula, um, allegedly on vacation. Um, um, but I was trying to find the least controversial statement I could possibly think of that undeniably linked climate to conflict. I said, okay, well, we can just, at least we can say that societies that are suffering from violent conflict are more vulnerable to climate change. And that's at least progress, because you look at every single IPCC before that, they just paint a generic average picture. Um, they don't take into account these acute uh, levels of vulnerability. But Richard Toll thought that was silly, um, so I was proud of that. Um, yeah, people who complain about organizations like the CIA you know, trying to work on these questions when they've got this culture of security. Um, this was a complaint about that El Nino study that I showed. Um, and for some reason, the biologists love to talk about um, mass migration. So Norman Myers got in a lot of trouble by making, he actually made a firm prediction on how many environmental refugees there would be. Um, and so when he turned out to be wrong, everybody jumped on him. Um, which just deflects from the, qu the real question, which is not whether his prediction was right, but whether climate stress is causing people to move involuntarily and if that's creating problems. That's what we should be talking about. Um, now the fight is most intense on this question of temperature and civil war. Uh, so this is a summary from Der Spiegel that says that we're in the middle of a scientific feud um, um, now, some of my colleagues respond to these things kind of on the merits, technical issues, point by point. And if you're interested in that, you can you know, read them. Um, but m my sense is that the, the objections you hear um, are, are much more consistent than the technical issues in the, um, in the actual publications. So I think there's something deeper going on. So I just wanted to briefly flesh that out. And um, the thing I'm doing new in this talk today is to try to air this as something that we need to focus on. So I think that one reason people just lash out violently against these publications that, that show a link is because um, they think it diminishes what they want to draw attention to, which is holding people to account who do bad things. Um, and there's this fear that, um, that blaming climate is going to let people off the hook. Um, and on the merits, that's just a silly point of view, right? Because um, 
Uh, we have no problem talking about, say, the relationship between poverty and crime, um, but we still hold criminals to account. We're, we still say they're responsible for their actions. Uh, so we shouldn't have the same intellectual challenge in doing the same thing here. Um, and this is where I think the, the communities, you know, their histories come into play. So a lot of the people who object to the climate conflict link come from the peace studies community, many of them from Scandinavia. So they, they've largely embarked on their intellectual career because they want to make sure that bad people stop doing that. Um, and, uh, and so it's, it's harder for them to, uh, to get into a more intellectual discovery for the causal forces that are driving uh, the variation in conflict. They want to keep the attention on the people. Um, so my point is that we just need to find ways to coexist um, because logically we should be able to do that. Um, the second fear, which I think runs even deeper and more widespread, is that you know, we've spent you know, probably 50 years trying to get rid of these roots of environmental determinism and racism. Um, you know, when people in the wealthy countries study politics in the poor countries, um, we have this legacy that we're, we need to overcome uh, in which a lot of stupid, um, disrespectful things have been said. Uh, this book by Wittfogel, Oriental Despotism, is one of the most famous. So he argues that the reason China and India have this authoritarian tradition is because they depended on irrigation to grow rice and other crops. Um, uh, they didn't have the stable uh, rainfall that, that Europe did. Uh, so it forced them to organize their societies in a way that could manage these irrigation systems. And that inevitably led them into uh, autocratic traditions. Um, you know, I think that idea is largely discredited. Um, and when I was in graduate school, we were taught, you know, don't even have those thoughts. Don't even think about it. Um, and I think we went too far. And, and people like Jared Diamond and Jeff Sachs and Paul Krugman have been trying to bring geography back in because it does matter. Um, this third and last one is the most depressing for me, um, uh, which is that we were on the cusp of you know, such good news. You know, it was just so recently that we were congratulating ourselves for having made this sea change in our ability to manage the problem of political conflict. Um, so Steven Pinker has this book where he argues that you know, um, this long-term historical trend is towards the you know, extinction of violence. And this is the kind of evidence that he's mounting. Uh, people like Andy Mack have been you know, um, you know, trumpeting the successes of the, the peace-building, peacekeeping communities. Um, through the Human Security Report with headline messages like this. Um, and those things are all true. Uh, but now we're hit with this reversal of fortune. Um, and I think, um, I, I even noticed this in myself, um, that it's, it's hard to accept the reality uh, that the world is getting worse uh, when we, we seem so close uh, to having lasting success. Um, so this is the trend in violence. Um, the, uh, the, the, the blue line is the um, internal war over time from the World War II to the present. This marks the, the effect of the end of the Cold War. Um, and I think what a lot of people who were um, most optimistic were hoping is that this trend was going to continue. Um, and what we've had is this instead. And I even, I even saw people who would point to like five years ago, if they were picking a fight with someone like me, they would say, well, wait a minute, look at this. The climate is going up, and the, the war is going down. You can't possibly be right. Um, and now we've got this going on, um, which is just very depressing. Um, and that's not just a small little tick in a graph, right? These are gigantic human consequences. Uh, this is the collapse of authority in Libya. Um, uh, the, the rise of ISIS and breakdown of order in Iraq, 
uh, northern Nigeria falling apart, uh, and everything that's going on in Syria. Um, and so this is, so for the first time ever, the world now has more than 50 million refugees. Uh, you know, if, in the Steven Pinker view of the world, that number should be going down, but it's going up higher than ever before. Um, so my message here is the good news was good news, and it was based on solid reading of the evidence. Um, but now we have these other things going on, this risk shifting and this uh, systemic breakdown phenomenon. Um, so we need action targeted on those things, uh, the same way we spent the last 50 years working on, on peace building. Um, sorry, I had, this is, this is my last explanation. Um, uh, a lot of people in the humanitarian field don't like working with the military. A lot of people in the military don't like working with the greenies. Um, and so, but if you take this view of the world seriously, these guys have to work together. Um, so, you know, my argument is just, we just have to deal with it. Uh, and there have been some really interesting examples of these communities over time working side by side and making some really interesting progress. So we need to build on that and then try some new things. Um, so my conclusion is this is a dangerous time. Climate is implicated. There's more to it than climate, but that doesn't lessen the severity of climate. It actually makes it more serious. Um, so we have to take it seriously. It's not an academic debate. It's a real life and blood issue. Um, so we need to be like Bernard Brody and acknowledge how different things are um, and get the work done that needs to be done. <laughs>